land value markets are also fairly dynamic. Um, maybe not to that extent, uh, but uh, they certainly do have some, obviously, some tax implications and, and uh, so on and so forth. But um, this morning, I plan to show you some slides and discuss some of the recent trends and patterns and some of the factors driving the land markets here in Oklahoma. I'll give you my suspicions. I guess my crystal ball is always pretty foggy when it comes to you know, the future, but uh, where we might be headed uh, for the remainder of uh, 2018. So before we get started, uh, I just want to remind the listeners out there that according to our study here at OSU, the typical farmland transaction is about 350000 Now that may not seem like much uh, compared to an irrigated quarter or to some of the ranch land parcels around the state, but you know, even at that kind of money, good market information and analysis is critical, especially if you're a, a participant in the market. Our land value study provides a market-based assessment since it reflects a sample of the sales transactions that do occur in Oklahoma annually. Our sales data is provided by the Farm Credit Associations of Oklahoma, and we once again certainly appreciate their assistance with our research and extension efforts. Real estate continues to be big news, you know, in the popular press, uh, in the coffee shop, primarily just because, uh, you know, a large proportion, over 80% of the farm sector's assets on any given farm is held in real estate. And so since real estate comprises such a significant portion of that balance sheet, a change in that value is a critical barometer of that farm and economic sectors uh, or that's, that uh, sector's economic well-being. So before we go any further on the, on the trends, I just want to remind our listeners out there that according to the Ag Census, and this is a 2012 version, that the uh, ag real estate market in Oklahoma is comprised of about one-third cropland and about two-thirds pasture. So growing forage is big business in the state, and livestock industry is obviously the major beneficiary of that. When you compare the cash receipts alone from crops and livestock, Statewide, about 80 cents of every dollar received does come from the livestock sector. And well over half the farms at least have some cattle on site. So while the grain markets do influence the cropland values out west, it's how well the livestock economy performs in the state that really carries a lot of weight on the real estate market uh, in Oklahoma. So moving to the most recent numbers, uh, this is where we're at, uh, and uh, this is uh, taken from our Oklahoma Land Values website, and you can see the web address at the bottom of the slide. And according to uh, the 2017 numbers, uh, we pretty well have peaked, in my opinion. Uh, I think we plateaued. The all-land composite has been moving sideways, mostly for the past two seasons. Uh, we do... Uh, see some continued upwards momentum in, in the pasture markets, but not much. And you can see that the cropland markets have uh, adjusted and corrected from that peak in about 2015. So what does that mean, uh, you know, in your region uh, or your neck of the woods? Have uh, values peaked? Well, it probably all depends. It uh, is, a, is a yes and no answer. And so when we... Go around the state, uh, and this is looking at uh, by regions of the state. Um, we'll talk about some specifics here. And so when you look at that statewide average of 183 uh, acres, and then multiply that by your 1900, that's where I get that 350,000. The overall change was uh, just modestly down by a fraction of a percent. Uh, we did uh, have some pasture land gains that did exceed um, cropland. Uh, for 2017 and this was the fourth year that that has occurred. Now you can travel around the state a little bit and uh, you can see that generally speaking um, we've had some uh, declines in the west and some gains in the east. Always, you know, there's always exceptions to that but that's in, a, in general terms that has occurred in 2017 at least according to our study. So when we look at the numbers even uh, more specifically, at least over several t uh, time frames, since 2016, you can see how the numbers have changed by region and then by um, 
parcel utilization. And then since about 2013, over the past four years, and then uh, since about 2007, over a longer term, uh, this is uh, prior to the ethanol boom that occurred uh, in the late part of the um, uh, first part of this decade. So um, you can see how those numbers have changed. I guess you can make some, uh, there, there are some observations that can be made from this uh, particular table. One is that uh, the average cropland value is lower than pasture ground. This is the first time that that has occurred since 2012, at least according to our study. That's really what four years of, uh, and maybe for other uh, individuals it's even been longer, four, at least four years of negative profitability. Most of your cropping enterprises have led to some uh, declines in cropland since that time. And as you transition across the state, you can see that once again we've had some weaknesses in the west uh, weighed by those cropland values uh, as shown in at least since 2013 down modestly. Uh, and then we've had some gains in the east, you know, a double digit gain since uh, about 2013 in the east. Uh, it's kind of curious how those numbers shook out, but that's the way it was uh, or, or is since 2013. And I think that we've seen some strength in the, the eastern part of the state, uh, primarily due to, hey, if you've got some productive uh, forage parcels out there, uh, you know, there's a number of cattlemen that are still willing to bid on those. And, uh, and so those parcels are still in high demand. I think there's another reason uh, because of um, some of the strength in the eastern regions. And that is because that we have a number of, uh, say, smaller uh, livestock operators or part-time uh, operators that may reside on some of these smaller acreages. Uh, they, uh, and these smaller acreages are generally speaking over, under 100 acres in size, but they commute back and forth to town. Most of their income is from off-farm sources. Uh, but uh, these types of parcels are in high demand. Uh, they could be used for recreational interests as well. So there's a number of these parcels in the eastern part of the state and uh, their value is uh, at a premium uh, as compared to uh, the other types of parcels that are available out there. And then, of course, out west, once again, you can see how that's weighed on the market since 2013. And, and really, you can see that even 2013 was prior to the peak in cropland values. So we've given back some of those double-digit gains that we had in the middle part of this decade. So we're back to about where we were in 2013 in many respects in the western parts of the state. Now there's a number of parcels that have increased or, or appreciated uh, quite a bit, but there's also been some parcels that have devalued quite a bit since then. So on average, that's how the numbers shake out. However, if you look at since uh, 2007 or the past, say, 10 years, you can see that you know by region of the state, it's pretty well leveled out. The playing field has leveled out, and once again, that was uh, supported by the doubling in cropland values, at least statewide, since 2007. Since all, you know, most of the cropland is found in the western part of the state, that supported a lot of those values out there. So um, this, is, uh, this is what has occurred, and uh, as, as you can see, you know, in real estate markets, you can see Obviously, location is everything, but you can say the same thing about the timing. If you bought cropland at the peak of the market several years ago, the value of that land asset probably is best tell its own and more likely has lost some value. If you bought cropland at least 10 years ago, its performance has been pretty good. If you bought pasture ground, its performance has been pretty steady over the past several years and certainly over the past 10. We haven't seen the Oh, the wide variations in, in uh, pasture land values over the past 10 years or so. Uh, not near as much as the roller coaster ride that we've seen in, in, crop, in the cropland market. So that's uh, essentially, in a nutshell, uh, how the, uh, the trends have uh, shook out uh, around in Oklahoma. Now, another way to portray that or illustrate those trends and patterns is to look at a chart and this goes back to at least 1997 over a longer term time frame. But you can see that uh, the western part of the state, which is represented by the, the red hues, uh, the, the central part of the state, which is 
uh, the greenish hues and the eastern part of the state, uh, which is represented by the, the bluish hues. Well, in the western part of the state, it seemed to have plateaued out. And uh, even in the north central region, where we have a sizable amount of uh, cropland, that has um, undergone some corrections to the down uh, downside. What I really like about the um, three-year weighted average is that it gives me a chance to look at these patterns and it smooths out the, those year-to-year -year variations. And so it's a little easier to analyze those trends and patterns over a, a, a time period. And I use that procedure really quite a bit at our website. But it also proves a point that you know, in the western regions of the state, including the north central, we've seen some corrections in the markets uh, over the past several years. So then, you know, uh, we don't necessarily have a corner of the land value market estimation. You know, uh, USDA NAS also conducts uh, some valuations or at least releases some information on that on an annual period, does it for Oklahoma. But their methodology and sampling population is different than ours. Theirs is, is, is survey-based. Ours is market-based. There's a survey base where they ask individuals in certain parts of the state as to what they thought, you know, their observations and, and their perspectives of the land markets over the past year. And so they're looking at the markets uh, from a little different perspective, a little different vantage point. And it's always easy or, or at least interesting to compare and contrast how their values are different. And sometimes there's a lot of similarities. You can see the trends and, and the patterns are somewhat similar when we look at cropland. They've had a steady upwards uh, increase in, in cropland values, even going into 2017. We had a decline over the past several years, but we also had a steeper increase going into mid-decade, and then it's been backtracking since. And so it'll be interesting to see in 2018 just how close uh, these values will, will match, whether or not they will reconcile with, with each other. Um, so uh, it'll be uh, curious to see how those numbers shake out. And then we go to the pasture land values, and you can see that uh, more or less there's a, a, a lateral shift uh, in our numbers versus the, the USDA's. And, and once again, I can attribute most of that to the fact that our data set has a lot of these smaller tracts found in the eastern part of the state that are priced several hundred dollars higher per acre than the larger tracts that maybe the USDA has uh, in their survey um, information. So that, uh, that pretty well, I guess, paints a picture of how our numbers compare to um, USDA's. In this case, uh, there's a lot of similarities in those trends and patterns. It's just an upward shift. So then I get the, you know, the question of um, what have values been doing so far in 2018? You know, our numbers won't come out until the first part of next year. And so, you know, in the meantime, you know, what's been happening? Well, the Ag Credit Survey from the Kansas City Reserve Bank uh, they conduct their um, their own surveys to the bankers within their district, and they ask uh, ecological questions. But one of those questions has to do with land values over the past year, from one quarter to the next. And at least over uh, looking at the first quarter of uh, 2018, you know we've seen some modest declines in the markets. Actually, they're relatively stable um, in the 10th district overall because we've even seen sharper declines in prior quarters. And so we are still seeing some adjustments downwards in states like Nebraska where there's uh, a sizable amount of corn and soybeans grown up there. But also I think we, we saw a sizable adjustment in Oklahoma, at least on the cropland side, because the cropland areas that um, you know were noted by the bankers a lot of wheat producing regions at that time just you know recall back to the first part of this year how tough the wheat crop looked uh, the yield prospects were were dismal prices were depressed and so the crop plan values as you know that were sort of indicative of of the the wheat uh, growing on those acreage at that time it just didn't you know, they thought that uh, that's really weighing heavily on those crop 
growing areas of the state. Now on the ranch land, um, you know, we, we've seen essentially no change in those values and it's a, it's a sideways market. And so uh, I see a lot of these patterns continuing, I think, going forward, and we'll get into more reasons here in the next couple slides. So, yeah, what, what's been driving these trends? Well, essentially, it's your expectations on farm income levels, interest rates, credit conditions, any of those, and really, it's all of the above. And really, think of land as a income-producing asset that anything that impacts the earnings impacts its values. And so it is the net present value of all discounted income flows. And so anything that impacts those flows in the future will impact today's value of that land. So as a proxy of uh, some margins, I guess, in the livestock sector and the profitability, I looked at CalCAF returns from the LMIC. And you know, going forward, the margins are pretty tight. They're pretty slim. They're not as bad as I think some have um, thought, you know, even going into this major herd expansion that we've seen over the past several years. Uh, we have more beef on the markets. We have more head that are being sold. But fortunately, we, uh, we have a strong uh, demand domestically as well as internationally and it'll be interesting to see how the the political winds will will impact uh, the demand on an international level but I think going forward because of these uh, slim profit margins uh, you know we're going to see mostly a sideways uh, movement in the pasture land markets going forward at least from a uh, a share uh, livestock um, say income standpoint and so I don't see any real strong upward trend or downward trend, but mostly sideways. Now, when you look at cropland, um, on the other hand, you can compare where we've been and where we've um, where we've been at least recently over the past several years. Now, I looked at wheat prices in the state, and uh, since 2015, obviously, we've uh, seen a major drop off in grain prices. Now, we're still in a low commodity price environment. Yeah, we've made some adjustments on the cost side, but probably not enough to make things really pencil out in terms of cash flow. You know, $4 wheat is better than 3 and 5 is better than 4 But I don't think that, you know, until we get into a, an outlook and a, 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 oh, a situation of at least $4 wheat, and it's better than, you know, it'd be better to have 5 uh, that we will move off a high center on, on a lot of these uh, cropland acres in terms of value. It's really hard to be optimistic about uh, the cropland regions of the state when there's still a lot of grain, say, worldwide. And so at these lower price levels, uh, I think that's going to weigh on these uh, cropland values until those prices do improve and resulting, uh, of course, farm incomes also improve um, going forward. So. Another factor that impacts uh, future trends uh, is, of course, our interest rates. And unfortunately, you know, we, we've seen some low and stable interest rates over the past several years, but they're also trending back up. And it's actually the highest that we've been over the past several years. They increased in the first quarter of this year compared to last year. And uh, those um, rates rose relatively more sharply in 2018, as you can tell here. Uh, by these charts. You know, higher interest rates increase your operating costs. It squeezes those profit margins. It, it increases your debt financing of, of land purchases. And it puts a, a lot of downward pressure on the markets going forward. So this is going to weigh heavily, I think, uh, on the markets going forward. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, sort of a, uh, a situation of um, it's putting a lid on a lot of these uh, uh, land markets going forward. And you can see how this has really impacted farm income and, and spending over the past several years, at least from the uh, uh, district-wide uh, surveys, once again, by the Kansas City Fed. And you can see here that uh, district bankers reported that farm income and spending continued to decline. And the decline in the first quarter makes 2018 
the fifth consecutive year that bankers have reported lower farm income than the year before. Now let that sink in for a moment. It's been five years, you know, since we've been digging, you know, uh, and and digging deeper and deeper. And now we're starting to try to dig dig out of it. But uh, we've dug, you know, ourselves into a hole pretty deep, and it's going to be a while before we get back to even terms, you know, with with expectations on farm income. So, you know, you can look at this uh, from the standpoint of a glass half full, half empty. Half full says, well, hopefully the worst is behind us and the declines are actually slowing, okay? But the glass half empty em empty will tell you that, hey, we've got a long ways to go before we get to income levels anywhere near than, you know, where we were in the first part of this decade. So we still have a ways to go. And you can see how this has impacted uh, capital spending on machine repurchases, on land um, uh, acquisitions, as well as uh, the uh, the household spending levels as well. How has this impacted cash flows? Well, it um, it's been a real detriment on the cash flow perspective. And and looking at this chart uh, in terms of farm loan requests denied. From cash flow shortages and from a shortage, uh, you know, and, and liquidity uh, liquidity levels in Oklahoma, it's about one out of ten. You know, district wide, it's eight uh, percent. And so Oklahoma actually is about as bad as any of the other regions, uh, you know, within the tenth district, uh, at least according to the the first quarter of this year. And I think a lot of that had to do with uh, just those poor weak. Uh, growing conditions coming on board and uh, so we had uh, a number of situations where you know business as usual and the status quo concerning uh, business operations for a number of these farmers and ranchers uh, just ain't cutting the mustard and uh, I would imagine that a number of these individuals were highly leveraged going into the downturn a number of them are you know beginning farmers and ranchers but even I think there's a number of these individuals that have been in the you know farming business for a number of years now, and they've been caught in the in the in the downturn, and so they've had a tough time making some you know readjustments to cope and respond to these uh, higher interest rates, for instance, and low commodity price levels, and so I think it's really up to us uh, to be available to these individuals. They're they're asking questions. They're wondering what can we do. Uh, to make these adjustments uh, and um, I think that we need to provide them some good research-based information and advice uh, and which to guide their decisions on and hopefully we can we can do that because we really need to keep these folks in the farming business because you know one of these years you know we're going to be in a position to hit a home run and I want those folks to be in the game to uh, experience that so in summary uh, this is uh, where we're kind of at for Oklahoma, where we've been, where we're at, and where we might be headed down the road. So I think the peak or the plateau is in for Oklahoma. I think a, a continued mostly sideways trend is likely for all land for 2018. I think we're going to co uh, continue to see some continued weakness in the cropland markets. Pasture, probably a sideways motion, and then when you blend all that together, mostly sideways. But you know, a majority of the farmland is still purchased by active farmers and ranchers. Uh, but you know, when these farmers are reluctant to buy, you know, demand falls and isn't uh, likely to be supported by outside investors. There's a number of these folks uh, at the margin, but there's just not enough of them to fill the gap. So even though the farm economy has shown signs of stabilizing, like I showed in the meat uh, or the wheat slide, uh, showed in the uh, the farm. Uh, income levels, hopefully the worst is behind us. The turnaround of land values won't happen until projections for farm income uh, do rebound and those credit conditions also improve. And also I, I wanted to get on my soapbox for just a second and mention uh, at least my personal advice for listeners out there and especially for those producers out there are thinking about entering you know, into the land markets of, of expansion. Uh, and I would try to make the best decisions that you can for your operations given input from folks that are knowledgeable 
uh, like uh, the extension personnel out there in the field. Also from your lender, keep those lines of communication open with your lender. See if it's a good idea or not. Keep good business records, financial production, see if you're headed in the right direction. You'll know what your cost of production are. You'll know if the market is offering any pricing opportunities. And you'll know whether or not, uh, you know, if there's any profit to be made based on those costs of production. I'm sure that there are some prop or opportunities out there to buy some land. You know, on one hand, you think, well, since interest rates are rising, I might as well go ahead and buy it now before interest rates are even higher down the road. But on the other hand, the big drawback is that I don't see much of a major recovery in commodity prices, at least for the foreseeable future. And so, you know, based on those constraints on your cash flow, you know, it's something to be aware of. And uh, just don't do things that put you at risk in the future. I think in general terms, I wouldn't say this is a bad time or a bad idea to expand your operation. But I will say this, it's a bad idea to get over leveraged doing so. All right. So. With that, I would really encourage your um, visitation. Uh, go ahead and check out our land value website through OSU. It's a good source of information, as well as from the Kansas City Fed and also from the USDA. All valuable sources of information. I think you can, you can compare and contrast their values with ours. And I, guess, I think it gives you a well-rounded perspective of what's going on in the markets in terms of where we're at, where we might be headed, and the reasons behind that. So, really, I really you know appreciate uh, you folks for tuning in this morning, and uh, hopefully it gives uh, a number of you at least uh, some insights as to what's been going on in the land markets, and then that uh, that way you can uh, exchange and discuss with the producers that you uh, serve out there a little bit about um, their particular situations, and uh, hopefully it can you know provide them some good information which they can base some good decisions on. So once again, thanks, and I'll turn it back over to JC.